Oh, okay, I'd like to call this meeting of the Urbana City Council Committee of the Whole to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Here. Mr. Evans? Here. Ms. Hersey? Here. Ms. Colasetti? Ms. Bishop? Here. Ms. Wilkin? Here. Mr. Quisenberry? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. Thank you. And our first item is approval of the minutes from the previous meetings from July 6, 2021. Is there a motion? I move approval. Second. Okay. Thanks. Moved by James, seconded by Chandra. Any discussion or corrections? Okay, seeing none, those minutes are approved. Oh, and a vote, sorry. Um, vote, could we have all in favor with aye? Aye. aye? aye. Any opposed? Okay, now that passes. Uh, next, we have additions to the agenda. Any additions? Okay, seeing none. Our next item is public input. Um, if anyone would like to address the council, please fill out one of our cards and indicating if you'd like to speak before the meeting at public input or at the time of the agenda item. And I have one here from Alan Max Axelrod about public health, housing, and SWIFT, I believe. Uh, thank you for the timer. Uh, so, you know me as the campaign lead of a group called No Ameren Shutoffs. We are a zero dollar budget, all volunteer coalition of 49 member organizations spanning the state of Illinois and beyond, north and south, east and west, as well as the states of Iowa, Indiana, and we are coordinating with folks in New York. On April 12th, you as a body voted to unanimously approve a resolution on utility shutoffs. The week after that, Bloomington City Council did the same. On April 22nd on Earth Day, Governor Pritzker issued two executive orders, one that had something to do with Earth Day and the other one addressed utility shutoffs. He at the time announced $80 million for 80,000 households. As of May 17th, he announced that that had been expanded to $115 million, perhaps because we kept passing resolutions in other bodies such as the Macon County Democratic Party, Champaign County Democratic Party, University of Illinois Student Government, the Peoria City Council, McDonough County Democratic Party, and so on. $115 million for 115,000 households. That program expired June 30th of this year. Two weeks after that, our COVID caseloads went from a few hundred on a bad day to over a thousand every day two weeks ago. It's over 1,500 every day this past week. Yes, the Delta coronavirus strain is more contagious, but we also know that we have increased the risk posed or the vulnerability of our residents in this state. In recognition of this, on July 14th, or perhaps in anticipation of this, the Sangamon County Democratic Party became the eighth body to pass a resolution, unanimously by the way, on utility shutoffs. That's chaired by Dick Durbin's former senior staffer, Bill Houlihan. So when I'm talking to you about pandemic safety, it's not exactly like it is a radical fringe opinion. It is widely shared across six counties in this state. We have, with the expiration of the federal eviction moratorium and the state component, a serious issue on our hands. We also have an open letter that many of the people seated here have signed from January calling for the suspension of evictions. This was done in part because last year during the coronavirus outbreak before the state of Illinois had an eviction moratorium, before there was a federal eviction moratorium, Champaign County Sheriff Dustin suspended the enforcement of evictions. Our COVID caseload is quite severe and is going to be increasing unless if we do something about that. In addition, there is some misinformation circulating for partisan reasons when it comes to the coronavirus 
situation and the propensity towards vaccines. 49.6% of the population is fully vaccinated. That is a larger percentage of the population than voted for president in 2020. Less than half of the people who are unvaccinated are Republicans, less than half. That means the majority are people who are struggling to make ends meet, maybe even are essential workers, and I know a few. We need to offer both to the cynics and to the people who do not get paid time off monetary incentives for people to get vaccinated because the PR campaign that's been rolled out has resulted in the same vaccination level we had all the way back in January when the vaccine was scarce and limited to who got access to it. Also on the note of public health, because as the public health district uh, noted, and Chandra, you were in attendance to that meeting, thank you for doing that. The public health district noted that systemic racism is a public health issue. The SWIFT program, the Support for Workforce Training program, represents a way to substantively address a systemic issue. With a lethargic canvassing, in my opinion, premature for the organization building yet attained, we have, just among the DSA, 60 petition signatures for support of these demands that we had presented on the SWIFT program, which was, again, increasing enrollment and increasing the stipends of all enrolled. And we have 21 of those signatures saying that they would like to enroll in SWIFT. That's nearly half of the people who were enrolled last year. PSL has 100 of those. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Tracy. Hi, um, I'm Tracy Chong. Um, so I'm wondering whether there are any updates uh, to allowing public input uh, via Zoom. Um, so Mayor Marlin and City Legal, this is, they did once again what they've done previously, um, that is to use an unfounded legal excuse to make it harder for the public voices to be heard. These past actions of Mayor Marlin alone have resulted in the city using taxpayer dollars to settle an OMA lawsuit. So what are you guys going to do about it now? It's been two weeks um, since this issue was brought up, two weeks since we said we could not find any clause in the OMA that um, allowed public input to be, give, to be given via Zoom. So I hope we can um, come to a resolution soon and hopefully the public can um, give public input via Zoom. Um, also, I was surprised to see um, the past two city council meetings canceled. Um, and at least one of them, the excuse given was um, that it was due to a lack of agenda items. So to me, this seems very odd since, um, since discussion items that the public have been calling for have always been pushed to the end of city council meeting where everyone is tired and ready to go home. And many times we've heard that um, the meetings are too long, um, that uh, we've heard Mayor Marlin say that uh, we can't discuss it we can't discuss in, in depth because there's city business to attend to. So, yeah, it, it was disappointing to see that two weeks of city council meeting just cancelled like that, when that time could be used to discuss all the issues that the public has been bringing up over the past more than, the, more than one year ago. And um, this gives the public the impression that all the issues that we've brought up, such as police, uh, the police use of false policy, um, the officer taser misconduct, CPRB issues, funding for social issues, things that people have been wanting to discuss meaningfully um, for more than a year. Uh, you just have a meeting cancelled. So that really gives us a bad impression. Um, finally, um, at the last uh, Civilian Police Review Board meeting, the board proposed to revisit and discuss the taser review where Deputy Chief of Police Richard Searles suppressed evidence and City Administrator Carol Mitten prohibited CPRB members from voting again on whether the taser usage was acceptable when eventually the suppressed evidence was presented. So the next CPRB meeting will be on August 25th. Uh, so I hope that all of you who, has, who have voiced concern um, who, has, who have voiced concern after listening and watching the 
taser footage um, during the past two reviews will actually attend in person and maybe um, we can actually have a discussion on these issues. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Eddie Pratt about SWIFT. Good evening. So, it's a, it's a little interesting, a little, little, little different seeing your faces. Some of you have seen me already for one reason or another, but um, I've been waiting to get a chance to come in here and talk to you all. In lieu of uh, comments made, the last time you guys uh, met concerning SWIFT, I just wanted to say, which though I couldn't be present, I heard about what was said. I'm not particularly interested in uh, going back and forth about it, but what I will say is that it's a common trope that when it comes to equity, when it comes to being a good neighbor, when it comes to doing the things that will produce positive results for a given people. It is a common trope to put that workload on them. Now, is it fair? Of course not. What does it lead to? Those people burning out and then the excuse is given. Look, see, didn't work. So why should we invest in it? Nonetheless, we are meeting that challenge head on. In the streets, every week, at least two different organizations are going door to door and seeing about people's interest in the SWIFT program. And I have to say, the results so far have been overwhelmingly positive. We have equality that was fought for, the ultimate price paid for. That is the time we live in now, believe it or not. The next path, the next fight is for equity. And then we can talk about justice but providing people with a path out of poverty ultimately leads to crime reduction. It ultimately leads to home ownership. It ultimately would lead to more property taxes into the schools in those areas and mostly would end up leading to more college applicants from that same area, it will be prosperous for all, but only if we all make a decision to invest in the people, because it's the people's money, is it not? Wasn't it not too long ago this body did an analysis of their budget from the pandemic year and found that they actually didn't do too badly. This ask is not asking for all of the ARP funds. In fact, a very small percentage for the ask to be completed, an intergovernmental agreement between this body and the body of Champaign to each match the original funding of the program, which was a $1 million contribution. That's $2 million. Out of the slated funds to come to this city, that amounts to one-tenth. For the city of Champaign, even less than that. So, and if we're being honest here, these cities have in their government agreements that dwarf that number. So as fact is, of the matter is, this is feasible. The real question is, how long do we have to wait? 
How long should we wait? The price of inequity is death. I don't know if you're privy, but you see the news, right? You see where these, these things happen? They're in the most inequitable parts of our city. It's where the home ownership is the lowest. It is where the wage uh, by household is the lowest, nowhere near the median. And so I hope that you are all committed to the people's front. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak now during public input? Seeing none, our next item is staff report. Is there any? Yes, Mayor Marlin. Just wanted to let folks know that last week the um, ribbon cutting was held on Pinewood Place, which is a permanent supportive housing uh, facility at 1606 Colorado Avenue in Urbana. There will be 24 one bedroom units available for people who are awaiting. Uh, SSI benefits through Social Security. Um, 19 of the units will be available for Champaign and Cunningham Townships to make referrals to, and then five of those units will be referred through the state referral network. But what this represents is really the first time that this particular type of housing is available um, in Urbana, and it represents a wonderful um, option for people who are uh, near homeless, chronically homeless, or with disabilities who are waiting support. So they will go into the uh, the um, homes with a t uh, project-based voucher, and then when they get their Social Security benefits, they will leave with a tenant-based voucher that they can take to find other housing. But in the meantime, it's a beautiful facility. It was developed in uh, cooperation between the Housing Authority of Champaign County uh, the city of Urbana and um, private financing. So we hope to see more, more units like this integrated into the neighborhoods near the near stores and services and on the bus lines. So it's very, very great project, and I hope you can all go take a look. And they expect to start moving people in, uh, I believe, in August. Thank you. Thank you. Any other staff reports? Next item is ordinance number 2021-07-027, an ordinance approving a preliminary development plan for planned unit development, 101 West Windsor Road. Um, and we have a staff presentation. Good evening, Council. This might be the first time Could you I speak into the microphone, Sorry. please? Thank you. I think this might be the first time I've met some of you. I'm Marcus Ritchie. I'm in the planning division. This is a request by Clark Lindsay Village for preliminary and final approvals of a residential planned unit development at 101 West Windsor Road in the R3 single and two family residential zoning district. Prior to the meeting, staff received one letter of public input in support of the requested PUDs and it has been included in your packet. At the July 8th, 2021 meeting of the, the plan commission voted with five ayes and zero nays to forward the cases to city council with a recommendation of approval and staff concurs. Uh, representatives of Clark Lindsay Village are in attendance and available to answer questions. The site is located at the southeast corner of Windsor Road and Race Street. Clark Lindsay is a continuing care retirement community with independent living units, shelter care units, and a skilled nursing skilled care nursing facility. The campus has been developed in accordance with previous PUD approvals in 1973, 2013, and 2015. The property is made up of two parcels, approximately totaling 27 acres, and is zoned R3, single and two family residential. Nearby is Stone Creek Church and single family residences to the north, 
Meadowbrook Park to the east and south, and agricultural uses to the west in Champaign County. The requested PUDs would allow for new development on the existing campus. The development would include two new three-story apartment style independent and assisted living buildings, two new independent living villas, an expansion of the wellness center, partial demolition of the existing nursing care facility with upgrades to one wing, a new grounds building and additional parking. The future land use designation for the property is multifamily residential. It's up here in the upper left hand part of the screen. Future land use map number 14 includes notation that identifies the site as Clark Lindsay Village and the requested PUD aligns with the future land use designation of multifamily residential. The existing uses on the site are residential with a mix of housing types, uses, and amenities. Three of the four wings of the Meadowbrook Health Center would be demolished to make room for new construction. The existing wellness center would be expanded to include additional amenities and a new auditorium space. The standalone carports near Race Street will be demolished to make room for the new apartment style assisted living building. Those are these garages here on the west side. Uh, the garage on the north end of the site will also be demolished to make room for additional service, surface parking. The four quadplex villa buildings will remain in the northwest corner of the site and two new villas will be built to the south of those villas. The new development will be built out in four phases starting in the southeast corner and working clockwise beginning in the fall of 2021 and concluding in the summer of 2025. The first phase will include the two new independent living villas, totaling eight units, a grounds building and completion of Burns Drive. Phase two will follow with the assisted living apartment style building and improvements to the healthcare wing. This would bring online 64 new units. In phase three, the independent living apartment style building and wellness center expansion will be completed. Uh, that will bring on 48 new units and phase four will complete the north parking lot. Phase three will remove three wings of the existing facility. So that will offset the number of new units coming in. Improvements to the Clark Lindsay Village Wellness Center will include expanded fitness spaces in addition to the existing aquatics and fitness amenities and memberships will be available to community residents ages 50 and over. The wellness center expansion will also include an auditorium that will be open to the public for not-for-profit events, education fairs, and other community events. The new buildings would be well integrated into the existing campus, constructed with high quality materials and contain elements that align with the PUD recommended design features. These are detailed more in the staff report. The applicant is requesting waivers from certain zoning ordinance requirements. One is to allow for two new buildings to be 43 feet tall, which exceeds the 35 foot maximum. These are for the two three-story apartment buildings. Uh, second, to allow for additional monument and wall signs on the campus. And third, to allow new parking spaces to encroach into the required front yard along Race Street. The request also includes two waivers previously approved in 2015. These waivers allow for a private street width of 25 feet and allow parking spaces to encroach into the required front yard along Race Street. They are included in this request again, just to administratively be consistent showing all of the waivers that are in place for the PUD, kind of for bookkeeping purposes. Uh, the waiver to allow for the increased building height would allow space for first floor covered parking in the apartment style buildings so that the carports can be removed. All other buildings will comply with the standard 35 foot maximum. The sign waiver would allow for the replacement of two existing monument signs, installation of one additional monument sign, and the installation of three new wall signs. 
The zoning ordinance already allows for institutions in residential districts to display either one monument or one wall sign per street frontage, and the requested waiver would allow for a total of six signs on the campus. The waiver to allow parking spaces to encroach into the required front yard along Race Street will allow for the existing parking lot to remain in the front yard where it is now and for additional parking spaces to be added in place of the closed access drive. To summarize, the proposed PUDs would help meet goals 2, 4, 15, 16, 19, 20, 29, and 31 of the comprehensive plan and they are consistent with seven of the nine general planned unit development goals of the zoning ordinance as detailed in the staff report. The proposed PUDs also align with the planned unit development criteria for approval. The Clark Lindsay Village campus and proposed development are conducive to the public convenience and not injurious to the surrounding area. Second, the proposed development is a continuation of the existing high quality, non-traditional retirement community campus. The campus has been on the site since the 1970s and the proposed development would provide additional memory care, assisted living and independent living housing choices and amenities for residents and community members. The plans incorporate a number of the re recommended design features suggested in the PUD standards of the zoning ordinance including pedestrian and vehicular connectivity, landscaping, open space, active recreation, and architectural design. <coughs> Excuse me. The city council has the following options for the preliminary and final development plans. To approve the ordinances, to the, approve the ordinances with revisions, or deny the ordinances. At the July 8th, 2021 meeting, plan commission voted with five ayes and zero nays to forward the preliminary and final PUDs to City Council with a recommendation of approval with the following conditions. That construction shall be in general conformance with the attached site plan and elevations, and that the Wellness Center will offer memberships to anyone 50 years or older, regardless of residency at Clark Lindsay Village, and that the auditorium will be available for community events. Staff concurs with these recommendations and conditions, the applicants are here to make a statement and answer any questions, and I can take any questions for staff. Just a point of clarification. I think only the first ordinance was called. Mark is presented on both of the first two ordinances, so just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yes, I think we can take questions and then hear from the applicant. Uh, Council Member Quisenberry. Yes, thank you. Um, so it, I, I think I heard, and you can correct me if I heard this wrong, um, the parking waiver is um, a, kind of a repeat of the parking waiver that already exists, but there will be more spaces that um, come into the front yard. So there are two different things. The okay. parking waiver is for parking that's already there on Race Street. Okay. to continue to encroach into the required front yard on Race Street. So that's for that parking lot specifically. So, so no new parking, just the same parking, same encroachment? There will, on in, Race, that, on in that Street. space, okay. correct, yes. And then there will be additional parking, surface parking um, along the north side of the property. Um, they're going to be taking a garage down and putting in more surface parking. And then my next question is um, the two buildings that exceed the 35 foot requirement. It looks to me like they're on the west side of the of the property. They're the new construction on the west side. I believe that is correct. But and and the 43 feet that is measured for their height because the villas are the same height as the other villas, right? I will defer to the applicants okay. on, on the technical specifications. <clears throat> so the, the other part of my question or comment is that that 43 feet doesn't look like it incre includes the nine foot aluminum screen on one of the buildings. So it's actually, looks like it's actually uh, 52 feet. So is this the uh, screen. 
aluminum screening on top of the building? Yeah. If okay. You, I'm looking at the diagram that's on. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the page here. Um, it's on page. A13, I guess, from the plan. There's an aluminum screen listed on the, I can't tell which side of the building it is, to the right of the drive. Oh, the aluminum roof screening yes, system. And that's nine feet tall, but it's not included in the 43 feet that is the building height. That is correct. It's above that. So um, that, that screen would be 52 feet. Correct. Okay. I believe that I might be. Um, something that is allotted by the zoning ordinance to address if there's mechanicals behind that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'll defer okay. to the applicants for that. Yes, Councilmember Wu. Um, so my question was about parking as well. So um, I understand maintaining the existing parking lot, but then the, the additional parking, can you point on the screen where the additional parking would be? So this would be the additional surface parking. Okay, yeah, so so if you go to the right side, is that the existing parking lot right now? Just, whoops. Uh, no, so there's a there's garage, a garage there. there. Okay. So yes, parking, there is surface parking here. So there's currently parking there, but there's also a fair amount of open space and whatnot. And um, I'm, a, and, uh, I believe the total number of spaces is higher in the new version rather than the old version. So yeah. it looks like those garages are being replaced by parking Correct. there on the north side of the street. And then there's just going to be additional removal of uh, some rearranging of the green space in the other one. Is that correct? Yes. Still meets open space requirements and floor area ratio. <coughs> So the, the, the rearrangement doesn't appear to encroach on the front yard, although I'm not adding up the, I didn't add up the number of feet. On the north side? Yeah. That is correct. It does not encroach into the required front yard along Windsor. So I guess I'm curious why, why do they need a waiver then for the rearrangement of the landscaping and additional parking spots? The, require, the, the waiver is for the existing parking along Race Street that was previously granted. Okay, so we're not we're not waiving additional frontage of the road. Correct. Is that correct? correct? This is just simply a repeat of a waiver that was granted in 2015. So we're okay carrying along the waivers that were already granted. Yeah, and I thought that there was only one part of that that we were carrying on. That there was something new here with the parking. So. I stand corrected. So the waiver, um, there's the waiver for the building height, the waiver for the additional signs, and the waiver to allow parking spaces to encroach into the required front yard along Race Street. That's the one that was already granted when the parking lot was initially built. Okay, so there's no waivers for new parking other than what was already granted. And where the access drive is being closed. So that's a, you know, a couple few spaces. Th that's addition. what I was wondering. How many spaces from the access drive? What, three, maybe? I don't know. You're talking 25 yes, feet. Yes, I got a nod from the applicant, three. Okay. All right. Thank you. But uh, so that waiver was previously granted for the parking along Grace Street? Yes, with the exception okay. of where the access yeah. is closed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Hersey. Um, I don't have any questions about the parking or the buildings or anything like that, but I was looking at where uh, goal 19 is, and, it, and I, I guess my, I'm curious because I've had at least one person call to ask if what is the, what is the, um, the total amount of new space that's going to be in 
added to Clark Lindsay. Total number? After all of this, how many new units and so on and so forth? I will defer to the applicants for that. With the complexity of the demolitions and removals and new units, um, I have not done the math on that being the I'll also the point out that pinch hitter. Mark, yes, Marcus is filling in tonight as we have um, someone that is under the weather and did not want to come in today and present. So thank uh, you for um, putting up with that. <laughs> okay, so we don't know how many new The units. applicant will be able to respond to this, those kinds of specifics. Okay, well, because my next question is, because what I don't understand either in keeping with, trying to keep with um, uh, the resolution of for racial equality and, and end of, to racism. What I wanna to wanna to know too is what kind of spaces will be, or will there be any spaces that will be available for people in lower income that come in from lower income neighborhoods? I know we're talking about membership regardless of residence and so on and so forth, but um, it, in, in where, I'm, where I am, Clark Lindsay is not, known as being friendly financially or economically regarding other um, residents that would otherwise not be able to afford to stay there. And we don't have the wealth, of course, that, that uh, as a black community, I, I can say that for sure, that many people might have so that they can sell their houses and they can just go and do and go stay, stay there. Um, so I wanted to know if there's any provision that the developers or, or the, the, the people that are in charge would have some cities, states have, um, I lived in California for years and they would, you know, whenever there were new developments there, there was a 10%, at least a 10% put aside for, um, for economically challenged uh, residents and um, not that that was a panacea because a lot of times what they would do is just build 10% of that somewhere in the poorest neighborhood that they could find mm -hmm. but I would like I would be interested in knowing and it's just my experience with I know with my when my mom being sick and stuff and how I've had to uh, uh, navigate mm -hmm. um, when they came, you know, saying that she needed therapy and stuff like that. And, oh, well, we'll take her in for 90 days. But it's like, well, what if she needs it past 90 days? <laughs> and I would just like to know, I know I hear great things about Clark Lindsay. I hear, don't get me wrong. I hear great things about the residents and a residential thing. But I hear awful things about how much it, it, yeah, uh, the inequity of how people who are lower income are not capable of paying for that kind of stuff. So I wanted to know what the percentage of new, uh, uh, if there were going to be, if there was going to be a percentage of the new units coming up that would actually uh, allow for the membership, uh, a, a member to, that maybe doesn't have so much to also be able to take advantage of those amenities, living there, not just showing up for the movie or doing water aquatics or whatever, but actually living space. So if you could pass that on to whoever, um, I'd be interested in knowing an answer to that question. Thank you, and I think we'll hear from the developers, the applicants next, and uh, Council Member Quisenberry. Yes, if I could reinforce uh, that point, it, if the applicants can speak to the, the net increase in, in units and how that will impact their ability to provide Medicare funded beds or Medicaid funded beds uh, in, the, in the facility, that increase would support um, lower income uh, people to participate in their, their beautiful facility. You. Any other questions for staff? Um, I have a few, uh, if I may. I was wondering if the city has any incentives for green buildings, like energy, water, water efficiency, or renewable energy. 
So there are programs that are available, the solar UC2B um, and the geothermal program, those are available for residences and commercial. Um, they are not being used at this project, as far as I know. And I was wondering why there's the 35 foot maximum for uh, building height. Like what's the rationale for that? Um, primarily because uh, those are for residential district, zoning districts. Um, in your typical residential zoning district, you don't expect to see more than two-story buildings. Um, this is, I won't say it's an anomaly, but this is a R3 zoned, that single and two-family uh, residential zoning district that this property is located in, so it's bound by those residential um, development regulations. Thank you. Any other last call questions for staff? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And um, next we have Daniel Godfrey from Clark Lindsay, as well as Deborah, if you want to come together, I don't know if you need to go one at a time. Good evening. Am I on? It's, it's hard to hard to hear myself at the mat. So, uh, thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, I'm pleased to introduce my team here. Uh, Dan Godfrey is our lead architect, and Chris Billing is uh, part of Burns Clancy, um, and is handling all questions related to parking. So, and other other things. Um, before we address uh, some of the questions that you asked tonight, I just want to give you a little bit of background in terms of um, the reason for the project. Uh, we are. Uh, okay. Is this better? Okay, thank you. So, um, as, uh, as Marcus said, we've been around since the 1970s and we've served several generations of older adults. And as we prepare our campus, um, for the oncoming baby boomers who turn 80 um, in 2025. Uh, this new repositioning allows us to meet um, their changing needs as well. Clark Lindsay's mission is to engage the mind, spirit, and body in wellness and community. And while this meeting is about the building itself, the place, um, we do that community building through our, our unique programs um, that help redefine aging. Some of the reasons for the taller building sites is uh, our commitment to maintaining the green space that Clark Lindsay is known for, adjacent to Meadowbrook. Um, and we're excited to continue to work with Urbana Park District in our long-standing partnership. We want Urbana, we believe Urbana can be seen as a retirement destination and combined uh, between the amenities of the university and the amenities of our expanded wellness center, um, we know that we can serve older adults who not only live at Clark Lindsay today and in the future, but older adults who want to remain in their home but still be part of a community. And the wellness center is a big part of that plan. So in terms of some of the questions you've asked, um, I'm going to leave the building questions to um, my team, but I think uh, just, I don't have all these numbers memorized, but I think uh, a general estimate of the number of new units we'll have on campus is about 70 um, net units. Also, in terms of the additional parking, while they, you might see some of the increase in surface parking, the plan also calls for two underground parking garages under the two big buildings. And so we'll actually net over 100 new parking spaces, um, which will allow us to accommodate those um, community events in our wellness center. Um, in terms of the questions about affordable housing, um, this project will, con we, we anticipate continuing to offer Medicare, um, Medicare as we do now. Um, and the number of those beds is still under review but we have capacity for at least 25, and we could increase the number of Medicare beds should we choose to. 
Um, in terms of uh, affordability, we do plan we, to extend our options of rentals. So sometimes an entrance fee model is not what the um, consumer is looking for, but a rental option will be available for our independent living as well. Um, I think uh, in terms of the building height in the aluminum screening, Dan, do you want to address that? Sure, sure. So that you guys hear me okay? Thank you for having us. Uh, in terms of the building height, uh, there are some provisions that allow you to screen the mechanical equipment uh, above and beyond the, the allowable building height. Uh, and just know that our mechanical equipment will be centered in the building. So in terms of the angle that you're viewing that, um, the distance it'll set back will be approximately 15 to 20 feet. Um, so the edge of the building is very much going to screen the screen uh, from anybody who's on Windsor or Race Street. Um, and we'd be happy to, to model those views. But, you know, just know that uh, it is set back. It's similar uh, in design to many of the buildings they have there now. And it will be a, a, the same kind of uh, method used to screen that mechanical equipment. Those were the questions that I wrote down. I'm happy to answer any other questions I can for you. Other questions for the applicants? Yes, Council Member Hersey. So you're saying you're offering, you may be offering a rental option? Right, as, as in our independent living area and our assisted living will both be uh, market rate rental um, products as well as the entrance fee model that Clark Lindsay is known for. So a, a combination of both of those options. And your Medicare, um, Medicare beds that you have now, those, um, you said there's like 25 of them now? Yeah, we, we currently have 37. Uh, we increased those a couple years ago. We'll, we'll move down to approximately 25 at the end of this project. And that's in the assisted living area or the, what is, what is that? Mm -hmm. Could that's, you, that's could in you the, define that for me? Sure, okay. that's in the skilled care area. So um, it's the most extensive nursing care area of the campus. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions for the applicants? Yes, uh, Mary Alice. All right, so you have, uh, you currently, you're calling the skilled care areas at the nursing home? Yes. But you're, you're removing part of that. We are. We have um, the significant part of our health care center, or known as Meadowbrook Health Center, is a combination of Medicare beds and long-term private pay beds. So the, uh, the wings that are currently uh, not certified as Medicare are the, the wings that will be um, demolished. So this is Medicare or Medicaid? Medicare. This is Medicare? Medicare. Okay, so this is like short-term nursing care, right. not Gen long-term. Generally following a hospital stay, yes. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Um, and can you just define the, the what, what level of service is uh, available for assisted living? Yes, uh, so assisted living is a state licensure as well, and so we'll have both uh, what, traditional assisted living um, and memory care support assisted living. And the difference between those is that the memory care uh, uh, option is, has additional security measures to prevent, um, prevent wandering, so, but assisted living uh, does not generally have those. So is, is it fair to say that assisted living, somebody has their own living space and yet you ha they have the ability to go have meals and, and yes. is that yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, our assisted living will be apartments, not, not rooms. Um, and those apartments will have uh, kitchenettes and uh, own private bathrooms. Residents who live in assisted living will be able to participate in the rest of the community um, events and dining program and they will have their own dedicated dining space as well. And has there been any discussion about um, the amount that the rentals would be? I mean, seniors are living on a fixed income, All right? So. Yeah, uh, well, there's been discussion, but those aren't set yet. So we're still continuing our market studies and uh, making sure that the financial <laughs> model makes sense, so. So currently your model is, is that people buy into the community, is that right? 
Yes, currently uh, the vast majority of our apartments have an entrance fee and then in addition to that a monthly service fee. And those cover the cost of providing the housing, the services, the meals um, for our residents at whatever level of care they're at. Okay. All right. And then um, for the for the wellness, the cost of the wellness, do you know roughly how much that would cost a community member to join? Uh, we haven't set those yet. I can tell you our current wellness center has a limited capacity, and I believe those monthly fees are close to fifty dollars a month. Um, but we but um, we haven't we haven't finished the financial model for the wellness center at us as a whole. We do anticipate having um, some. Um, scholarships available uh, so that uh, we can be widely widely available in our wellness center memberships and then for the auditorium it's going to be available to the community um, is there how is that going to work for community events yeah so uh, just as clark lindsay has in the pre-pandemic world uh, we would host um, groups like the Urbana Rotary and in other uh, social clubs and not-for-profits. This will be a space dedicated, uh, much more friendly for people coming in um, and finding parking, those sort of uh, barriers that are a challenge right now. We will have, um, we'll have staff available to help uh, coordinate those events. We'll have catering available if that's necessary um it, or desired but yeah it's it will be we we plan for it to be busy all the time okay thank you the questions yes james yeah, i just want to clarify what i thought i heard which is the amount of supported beds is going to go down in this project from 37 to 25 Yes, yes. So it's going to reduce access uh, for people who are supported, and it's only currently short term. You have no Medicaid long term beds at this point. That's correct. And my, when you talk about market rate um, for the apartments, uh, will that require any kind of, I'll call it a meal plan for lack of a better word? Will that, is that going to include meals, or is there going to be an additional meal plan that's going to be required? if you stay in a market rate apartment so our, our current model does include um, for most of most of our apartments it does include a meal plan um, as we look ahead to the future uh, we're, we're considering options that may not or may include more meals than the one meal a day that currently is the standard so we're we're modeling all those different options knowing that the future the future um, customer is, is going to require more, more choices. Thank you. Other questions for the applicants? Yes, Therese. So in other words, when you say that you'll be offering market rate rentals, then basically um, after all of this and, and you'll be taking down your, your Medicare bids or your nursing home bids from 37 to 25, there'll be a $50 a month wellness fee, okay. So in other words, no, you don't have anything really in place for people that are economically challenged. Well, our Medicare beds will continue to, to serve people of all income levels, and so um, that will continue to be available. Um, and in terms of our, the market rate rental, um, all of those, uh, all of the entrance fees and market rate rentals go towards building the community assets that would be available to serve to serve the community as a whole. So um, that 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 is the co we are we are not for profit, and so um, that is the cost of providing that benefit for the community and for the residents living there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Mary Alice. Did you just say you're not for profit? Is that what you said? We are. We're a 501c3. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I had a few questions. I was wondering if you could explain this additional monument and wall signs on the buildings. Sure. Sure. So, so part of the um, the project, uh, the the goals are to create a new first impression for folks arriving, but also to help inform where they're going. 
uh, to make sure that we have a hierarchy of arrival experience and that the signage is appropriate to the scale of the folks who are going to be coming. So, um, you know, the, the main, I guess, monument sign that's right there off of Windsor will be replaced with new signage. Then at the corner of Windsor and Race will be replaced with new signage to respond to the intersection similar to the uh, other uh, properties that are on those intersections. And then there will be a monument signage that tells folks where the new assisted living building is. Uh, along with the monument signage, we're also going to have wayfinding signage added. Uh, but I, in Chris can weigh in on this, that the general site design uh, is, is reconfigured in a way to help folks find the front door. Uh, so we've worked really hard to make sure turning radiuses and all those things work with the signage to lead people uh, to the right place. Thank you. And that was um, also trying to understand the cut in the Medicare beds. And that's because you're not expanding that facility or that is being reduced. Could you explain the reason why you have to cut the Medicare beds? Well, we're trying to, we are trying to maintain the density of the buildings without um, infringing more on the green space. Um, also, we are addressing the current trends of a reduction of skilled care beds throughout the nation. This has to do um, primarily with uh, the customer's desire to bring services to their home and uh, shorter hospital stays as well. So all of these are trends affecting the skilled nursing business as a whole and uh, reduction of beds across the nation. Thank you. And would it be possible to accept Medicare for your longer term stays? No, that's, that's not how Medicare pays. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicants? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you guys, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we can move to discussion or looking for a motion for, um, I think we could take these one at a time. Is that the right way to do it? Do the preliminary and then the final development one? You'll need a motion to get it on the floor for discussion. Oh, yes, do we have a motion for the first one? Yes, Mary Alice. Uh, yeah, I'll make a motion so that we can discuss this. Ordinance number 2021-07027, an ordinance approving a preliminary development plan for a planned unit development at 101 West Windsor Road, plan case number 2422, PUD 21, with a recommendation for approval to City Council. Thank you. And do we have a second? second. Okay, we have a motion by Mary Alice for <laughs> approval of the ordinance to City Council. Seconded by James and discussion. Yes, James. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes, thank you, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, question to the city administrator or the mayor. Uh, would these properties be taxable on the tax rolls? That's a yes? Yes. Okay. Did you ask if they were taxable? What's that? Did you could you repeat that question? I just was asking, would the properties that they're developing, would those be on the tax rolls? I'm yes, and in yeah. fact, I sent information out late this afternoon. Um, I asked the township assessor, the 2020 tax bill amounted to close to $700,000. Okay, great. Property taxes. Thank you. All right. And James? <clears throat> All right, I, I, think, um, I think Clark Lindsay is des definitely an asset to South Urbana. Um, in fact, my dad spent some time there. Uh, they do have do, they do have a great facility. Um, looking at the things that they're asking for uh, waivers on, uh, because of the taller buildings being on the west side, essentially on the Ray Street side, I'm not I'm not too concerned about that. That doesn't impact on Meadowbrook Park the way uh, I would worry about it. Of course, the parking is already already there. It's not a new thing. And for the size of the property, I, I, I don't have a problem with the monument sign configuration that they're asking for. I mean, that's designed for our requirements for residential areas are not talking about a block of, of this size typically. And so I, I support those things, but I am, I am particularly concerned um, because I spent some time on the county board uh, while the nursing home was still owned by the county um, 
I am concerned about the decline in, in skilled nursing uh, beds being available, and I, I, do, um, I do also have concerns about none of these amenities being accessible to the, the broader population. Uh, it is essentially accessible to people of means, and reducing the number of beds uh, is, a, is a concern to me, and so I'm, I'm having to think about this from a standpoint of um, where, where, is the, where is the service to the community and asking for um, waivers from the regulations of the community. Um, and so I'm, I'm not completely sure. I, I support what they're asking for. I don't think it's out of line, but I, I'm concerned by the reduction in, in Medicare beds. Thank you. Mary Alice, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I appreciate the summary that James just provided. I, I agree that the three items that they're asking don't seem to be um, onerous. Uh, people are usually um, used to me complaining about building sizes and, and uh, heights and so forth, but I, just exactly what James said, this is facing the west. There's nothing to the west that's currently built. Um, I'm assuming because it's law that you have to actually give to the property owner's notification to come that there is a plan unit so that anybody who was on the north side of um, Windsor Road would have been notified and we didn't hear from anybody. Um, so, so I, I mean, I pretty much agree with everything that James has said. Uh, I, I will say that the market is definitely changing in terms of the needs for the elderly um, in the United States, and there certainly has been a shift of, of a need for assisted living, different kinds of assisted living. So I understand um, Clark Lindsay's desire to provide that need to the community. Uh, Clark Lindsay has had an excellent reputation um, for the type of service to the people who can use it, uh, who are able to participate in that community over there. So I, I mean, I, I sit with James on this. Uh, it is disturbing to hear that we're gonna lose some nursing skilled facilities, but even without the PUD, they could still reduce that. Um, th there's nothing in this PUD that, that would, uh, there's nothing that would prevent them from doing that. So um, I'm leaning towards supporting this uh, just because I think it's reasonable. Uh, the types of variances or, or waivers rather that they're requesting. I think it's appropriate for us to be using a PUD in this case. I think it's, uh, this is kind of what the PUD was designed for, to allow for a mix of different kinds of buildings in these areas. It's a very large area. Uh, we're not talking half an acre, we're talking 23 acres. So I, I think it's appropriate for the PUD as well. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, I would say I, I have some comments. Um, I agree with previous council members on the need for senior housing and skilled care facilities and independent living and also the even more extreme need of needing that to be affordable and accessible to those who might not otherwise be able to have that by economic default. Um, so I agree that it's a shame to see some of those Medicare beds reduced um, and it's a shame to try and find affordable housing or care for seniors in this community. Um, I have done that as well a bit and it is definitely a challenge um, but I also see that this particular allowance doesn't have direct control over that. Um, but I just would like to say to all that I really hope that we can find some other kinds of solutions, um, maybe some kind of partnership, potentially down the road with the township with assistance, maybe with some tax relief with the city if that could be a possibility. Um, sounds like a lot of those other details aren't figured out yet about the cost and the number of beds. And um, I think that regardless of how this initial um, PUD goes, I would like to see some kind of more long-term creative solutions to find more affordable senior care in the community in general, and particularly at such a nice facility like Clark Lindsay. And any other comments? Yes, Sean. Um, I see with the recommendations there, um, there are conditions. So will that be included in when we pass the resolution? When you spoke, when you read the resolution, Mary Alice, um, it, the conditions weren't on there, 
and I, I would like to at least definitely keep number two. Um, and even if, I don't, I don't, I have no idea, but could there be a condition on not reducing the beds? I don't know, but that's just, just a question that crossed my mind. Can I say something so is my motion? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm happy to include in my motion that um, we send this to city council with a recommendation for approval, including the three recommendations made by the plan commission. Um, are they in the ordinance? Yeah, they are in the ordinance, yes. Okay. Um, right. Section one, it seems that they are already in the ordinance. Since they're reducing the number of overall beds, I don't know if we can ask them to keep the same number of Medicare beds, because I think it's a proportion that they're looking at. But so, okay. Well, if they're already in the ordinance, then my motion is stands. Um, and with your motion, did you want to have that for consent agenda? Uh, sure, we can put that on the consent agenda. Okay, so the motion is for approval of this ordinance, the preliminary development plan for planned unit development, for approval to consent agenda to council um, as those conditions are already in the ordinance. Okay, and any last discussion? Or ready for vote? Yes, Sharice. I, I guess the thing that I would like to ask is that because I considering what what we're actually voting on it i um I'm, I'm really not against the the expansion of the project itself but i would ask that um the you know the ptb's uh, clark and ptb's means powers that be uh <laughs> at clark lindsay would consider um on your own without you shouldn't I shouldn't have to ask that you try to make a um, an effort to uh, include others but I'm ask I'm asking that you would make an effort to come up with some kind of a plan financial plan that would be more welcoming of of um, others that w would possibly be able or would like to have residents at Clark Lindsay and not just um, do the 90 day Medicare skilled you know Medicare bid thing which you know you do right now that some people could use the assisted living and some people need it to be affordable so i'm just gonna you know i'm asking that you take that in consideration it's probably something that you've never been asked to do before so all uh like my mother used to say all you can say is no so i'm asking that you do that thank you very much okay thank you and any last discussions Okay, then we can go for our voice vote on this uh, ordinance approving the preliminary development plan for planned unit development 101 West Windsor Road for um, recommendation to council with approval on the consent agenda. And all in favor with an aye? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I think I need to let you know that oh, yes. ordinances, you need a roll call, resolutions, you can send by voice vote. Okay, thank you. Well, then, could we have a roll call, please? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Wu? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and that uh, ordinance carries, uh, motion carries. And next, we have on the similar line the ordinance approving the final development plan for planned unit development 101 West Windsor Road. And I believe we still need a motion for this one. I move that ordinance number 2021 07 029 and ordinance approving an amendment to a re 
to a redevelopment agreement with D and E Enterprises, L F. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Sorry, <laughs> an ordinance approving a final development plan for planned unit <gasps> development, 101 West Windsor Road, Plan Case Number 2423 PUD21. Um, move on to Council for approval on the consent agenda. Thank you. And do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, motion by Chandra for approval on the consent agenda, seconded by James. And could, uh, well, any discussion on this one, I guess? It's already kind of under the just, same thing. Just to clarify, that's 280728. Yes, thank you. All right, could we have a roll call, please? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Okay, thank you, and that motion carries. Um, and before this next item of the agenda, I will motion for a three minute recess before our next agenda item. And so we'll return at 8.13. Yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you all. Uh, next time I'll call for a five minute recess. Seems like more of the time that we need. Three minutes is too short. I just didn't want to keep everyone waiting. Okay. Um, so back from our recess, um, our next item is uh, ordinance number 2021-09-029, an ordinance approving an amendment to the redevelopment agreement with D&E Enterprises, LLC, 136 Main Street Series, Cohen Building, Building 136 West Main Street. And we have a presentation for this. Yes, we do. Um, I will be presenting um, some of the, the highlights of the amendment that we'd like to propose, but um, Dan Maloney, who's here representing the applicant, has a, um, a few slides he'd like to show you just so you can un understand and appreciate um, the journey that, <laughs> that he is on or, and has been on for a number of years now uh, regarding the Cohen Building, which is an important asset in uh, downtown Urbana. So that should be on the, um, we, we should have set this up. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, give a little brief presentation. Uh, again, my name is Dan Maloney. I'm with D&E Enterprises. And I just want to, uh, Carol Mitten had asked me to give an, a status update on the project. So I entered into a, an agreement in March 1st in 2017 for renovation um, of the Cohen building. And uh, just real quick, I'll go through kind of where we're at on each of these phases, but these are the phases that, I, that I've that i either have, have completed or very near completing. Um, one was including uh, adding an elevator, putting fire suppression through, throughout the building, um, making some improvements to the exterior of the building, and then uh, a tentative restaurant and bar on the first floor. So before I kind of give an update on those phases, just wanted to just kind of talk about a little bit of things of, of this project, what it's, what it's some essentially related successes. Um, we were able to get a, a Royer uh, commemorative, commemorative plaque put on the building um, to honor the Royer district. But more importantly, we were able to, um, this project, this renovation project um, was the driving force behind the Urbana um, Downtown Historic District. So that's something I'm real proud about having, getting that uh, set up. Um, and then with a lot of the renovation, we've been taking a lot of stuff out of the building. We've been doing our best uh, to be to salvage material. So we've been providing a lot of material to PACA and to Habitat for Humanity. Again, that's just a little bit of background information. Now to the phases. So the first phase, as I mentioned, um, was installing an elevator. Um, the elevator that was in the building when I bought it was just first floor, second floor, and it didn't work. Um, so we thought to, to activate the entire building is really important to have an elevator that went basement, first floor, second floor. Uh, so that began in 2019. It was a, a very interesting challenge to try to fit an elevator into that space in the building. Uh, so it took a lot, a lot of uh, uh, working with code and working with the city, uh, but we were able to get an elevator in there. Um, the pictures there showed the very far left is the original elevator, and then the next two are kind of in between the, the, the renovation process, and the last is the new elevator. It doesn't really look a ton different than the old one, but it is very much, much more functional. So. Um, so that, that project is completed. Um, the other oh, next phase is uh, fire suppression. So fire sprinklers on each floor of the building, um, obviously uh, important for the safety of the building and allowed, it's gonna allow us for any 
at numerous uses throughout the building. Um, so that's been completed. Um, it was quite a challenge. I don't know if anybody remembers 2019 that we were we took over the the the, the street for quite a while because it's quite a project getting running a six inch water main to the building. But that's been done, um, and so at this point the the building is completely under fire uh, suppression. And then the next is improvements to the exterior. Um, so shortly after getting the the TIF, I, we put solar panels on on the building. Actually, just within a few months of that. So that's been completed. Um, we've also done some exterior tile work and painting. Uh, right in the center bay, front of it, there's a, a, a sign that says Cohen Building, which I'm, I, I love it. it uh, a lot of people who go through there, see the building, they think it was there originally, but that was just done um, a couple of years ago. That's been completed. And then the, the last thing that's, that's in progress is doing some work on the tuck pointing and the facade. Um, if anybody's gone down uh, Main Street today or within the last week, you'll see a huge crane there. And so they're working on getting that tuck pointing um, all uh, looking good. So that's the last uh, piece of phase three that we're anticipating, and that should be done within the next few months. And then phase four, this is the, the real exciting one. This is a tenanted restaurant um, on the, and bar on the first floor. And so I secured a, a lease with Sakura Restaurant in November of 2018. Um, and we began the, uh, the commencement for the work. We did some de uh, demolition work prior to, to securing that lease. Um, that began in 2017, but then the work on the restaurant itself and the supporting area began in early 2019. And the status on that, the shell build-outs, the work that was done for that common space and the work that needed, needed to be done infrastructurally for the building, uh, that's complete. And then the restaurant build-out is complete, um, just pending final inspections. So they've done an, the initial inspections on everything and they just have their, their punch list um, for, for the various inspections. And they are hoping to open up yet this month. So uh, pretty exciting times. Um, and just the, the last I got is just a couple pictures of kind of those phase four. Um, the bathrooms we put in the shared space, I think are the most beautiful bathrooms in, in town. Um, and so they're, if they get a chance, you gotta see them. Um, those were originally offices, one large office in an old hallway that got converted to the, to the uh, men's and women's room. And then the hallway that leads into them is, is really beautiful as well. And then um, this is just some photos of, of the restaurant space. So it's again, Sakura Japanese cuisine. Um, there's uh, a picture, a couple pictures, uh, the inside and then the uh, lower right hand corner is, the, is a picture of the restaurant or the kitchen, I'm sorry. And you can see there, that's the original flooring in the, from, the, um, from the East Bay. So, and that's it. That's again, just a quick status update on what, what's going on at the Cohen Building. Thanks, Dan. Sure. So um, I, I just wanna give uh, the highlights of the amendment uh, that we'd like to make to the redevelopment agreement. And um, there's a few things that we are proposing to do. Um, one is to redefine the scope of phase four. So phase four was um, conceived before Dan had even probably prospected for tenants. And so as, as uh, tenants get identified and their needs are identified, then, then phase four actually came more into focus and it was different than what was in the redevelopment agreement. So we'd like to conform the scope of phase four to what is actually necessary for the Sakura restaurant. And then we are also, uh, through this amendment, agreeing that phase five and phase six are, are kind of off the table, that they, that they were not commenced. And in the future, we might entertain something related to those spaces, but those would be separate, um, separate redevelopment agreements that had well-defined scopes associated with them. And so because we're, we're changing the scope of uh, phase four, the maximum um, reimbursement that would be available would go from $166,000 to 98425 And we're also changing the way that the, the reimbursement is, I'll say, earned. So um, there's 15% uh, of the um, investment is available that, that has been um, made by um, the developer in uh, the restaurant space and the common areas is available at the um, once the the project if it, if um, completion is achieved on the um, project completion date that's dictated by the redevelopment agreement which is December 31st of this year um, which I, we all have every reason to think that that will be true um, and then um, because the, um, if you, I, I don't know if any of you went back and looked at the um, 
went back and looked at the uh, council report that accompanied the original redevelopment agreement, but a lot of the, the payback for the, the city comes in the form of sales tax, food and beverage tax. And so we wanted to create an incentive for the, the restaurant in particular to be operational because that's how we get paid back for the, um, the contributions that we make to this project. So we've, so we've crafted um, to a, a two, two year, it's earned in, you know, annually, uh, basically an incentive for the restaurant to stay open and to operate um, what we think are, you know, kind of minimal operating hours, we've defined that so that it's not something that seems uh, kind of more of like a hobby, but something that's being taken seriously. So, um, so that's, that's the gist of the amendments. And um, I'm here, Dan is here, and Steph McMahon is here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Mary Alice. Uh, well, first, I want to thank you for all the hard work, sweat, and probably frustration that you've taken in, in, in renovating this building. So thank you for taking this on. Um, I, I guess my, my only, what, the way you summarized it, Carol, was perfect because it, it put everything really nice and neat. My question has to do with um, all these percentages. So on page two, we have the original um, Percentage reimbursement, uh, maximum reimbursement, and so we're talking about really cutting phase six. Is that right? So that's seventy-three thousand. We cutting. would be eliminating from this agreement and the amendment. We right. would be eliminating phases five and six. Okay. Okay. That, so we're eliminating phases five and six, which is approximately one hundred and fifty thousand, and then we're cutting the one sixty-six to about ninety-three, ninety. 98. 98, 425. So that's like about 200,000. So approximately what we've committed to this project is about 300,000 max. Is that correct? At this point, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Chris. Uh, what's going to be the occupancy of the Japanese restaurant? Um, I think they were planning for 75. 75. Yeah. And what kind of tenants are you looking for on the second and fourth floor, or the upper floors? Uh, so actually, my, my company, we have, uh, my, I've got a consulting business as well, um, and we have, we take over about half of the space up there. And then we have big brothers, big sisters, or have some offices there as well. At this point, we have three empty offices, so. And I was for a long time kind of holding back try, as far as leasing upstairs in the hopes we'd get somebody to sort of take the, the, the rest of the um, West Bay and the second floor. But at this point, I think I'm going to commit to leasing out the rest of the office space up there. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I've got a few. I was wondering if you could um, explain just some of the layout here um, on the floor plan, what the mutual access egress space would be used for. Um, just kind of on your map here, besides the restaurant, um, kind of yeah. what else was going on on that first floor, like with the shared bathrooms, um, oh. shared with what, in a sense, like the restaurant, oh. and then what will the rest of that space be? Yes, sorry, yeah, so the, so the, the restaurant is in the east bay of the first floor and the center of the center bay of the first floor so in order for us to to be to utilize the west bay so we still have a lot of the first floor about half the first floor is still open for use um, we the, the plan was to have those those bathrooms as shared space so right now it's it's it'll start out just being used by the restaurant but the west bay can be used as event space and we have used it several times as event space um, then the, the restaurants will be available to the west bay as well okay so event space open yes. access big space yes. okay yes. cool thank you and then maybe for um, both sides here with cutting the um, phases five and six but you're saying you'll still you still plan on continuing those just oh, not absolutely. in the partnership yes. with yes. the city incentives is that correct yes yeah <laughs> definitely planning to continue develop yeah I'm, so I'm working on the West Bay right now in the, in the basement <laughs> yes it, one of the things was is getting the restaurant in was a really key point to, to sort of get to the next phase because that shared space and that they, they have some egress through the West Bay. Um, so now that they're coming close to opening up, which, you know, very soon that now 
feel a lot more comfortable progressing doing stuff in the West Bay. Ultimately looking for a tenant to, to lock into that, but um, we should pretty easily be able to get it to be just at least event space by the end of this year. So, Thank you. Sure. One of the things that I, I just wanted to say is, you know, Dan and I have had conversations about um, you know, w whether we would enter into a new redevelopment agreement for a, a subsequent phase. And I tried to lay out some of the challenges with the original agreement. And so the, the two things that we would do differently probably are he would have a much better sense of what the scope of the phase was. Because it was understandably challenging to scope the phases in the beginning. And then the second would be we would probably structure the agreement differently. We wouldn't, we, we, would, we would build in m more assurances for the city to get the payback, which is what we're trying to adjust for in this amendment. So, w but we're gonna continue to talk about those things as, as he progresses. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Yes, Mary Alice. Uh, I will move. Sorry, I will move ordinance number 2021-07029, an ordinance approving an amendment to a redevelopment agreement with D&E Enterprises, LLC at 136 Main Street series for the Cohen Building at 136 West Main Street to City Council consent agenda with a recommendation for approval. I'll second. Was that second, was that Chris? Okay, thank you. We have a motion to approve to consent agenda by Mary Alice Wu, seconded Chris Evans, and uh, any discussion? Okay, could we have a roll call, please? Ms. Hersey? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wu? Yes. Okay, that motion carries. Thank you, thank you Dan. Very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is um, let's see here, ordinance number 2021-07-030, an ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance, budget amendment number one from Omnibus. And we have a presentation. It, yes, it, it, it will be brief, but before we jump into that, I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce Aliana Robinson, who is our new fin financial analyst. She started right after the 4th of July holiday. Um, she has an accounting degree and has public accounting and private sector experience, and now she's tried, decided to um, move over into the government sector, so I'm very pleased to have her. You will be seeing her. Um, she'll be working on the budget, the financial forecast. She's, in fact, the person who did um, most of the work on this budget amendment. I'll be the one who speaks to it tonight, but know that she did the work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is our first budget amendment this fiscal year, the second one that I think this council has seen. So just as a reminder, all budget amendments require six affirmative votes, including the mayor, in order to pass. So that's a little bit different. Um, there are a number of items on here that are just really timing issues, and I'm, I'm not going to go into all of those in detail, but I'll talk you through a few of the more significant items. So first of all, in the general fund, we did receive a very generous anonymous donation for tree planting in community development target areas. So you'll see a new revenue related to that. And then we estimated that about a third of that would be spent this year. So we'll receive all of the revenue in this year, but then we'll spend it over several years. Um, two grants related to arts, one for $5,100 and one for $20,000. And I believe those are actually the, the grants are the next two items on the agenda. So you'll be hearing more about those shortly. Um, several items just carrying over planned expenditures from last year. And then I, w I will point out that um, the request to hire a temporary employee in community development, this requires a budget amendment specifically because the city code requires that if we move money between personnel items, line items and other types of expenditures, those be approved by the city council. But this is all of the changes done with the resources that are already in their budget. 
Um, in the, uh, I'll skip down to vehicle and equipment replacement fund, several um, fairly large items there, including um, purchase of air packs. So there'll be a rebudget from last year's budget. But in addition to carrying over the amount that we originally expected to spend, we will need an additional $54,000 for that purchase. Um, there are several things happening there. So first, the, the, we believe that the purchase price that was paid you know, five or 10 years ago was discounted, and that wasn't accounted for when it was put into the VRF. Um, recent price increases, and this has been not unusual during the pandemic, were much higher than expected. And also the standards for air packs for firefighters were changed requiring slightly more expensive equipment. Um, the street sweeper and public works at 319,640, that was just an oversight in the budget. We included the transfer from the sewer fund, but we didn't include the actual expense for the piece of equipment. So I'll call that a technical correction. Um, really other items, other couple of other items that are just carrying funds forward in the budget. And then the final item is in the American Rescue Plan Fund. So we're currently holding the first half of our ARPA allocation. And there's still much, a lot of process to go through there. So we're proposing to use the Regional Planning Commission to facilitate that process, develop a plan, and also assist with the financial reporting. There's a fairly heavy workload associated with, with managing the $13 million. And so we're estimating that we would need 100,000 um, to cover those fees for services in the current fiscal year. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions, yes, Mary Alice. Um, so we already approved the donation for the tree planting, accepting it. So why is it appearing here? So you, you accepted the donation, right. but it wasn't budgeted. So we have to budget it. <clears throat> okay. And then I, I should remember this, but I don't remember where the 20,000 website donation came from. Um, I don't, did it, that was an anonymous donation. An anonymous, it, is that, that supposed to be redoing some of the city website? The goal is to replace it. We just, it's just one of those things that has not been done yet. Okay, but at least we have a, a starter yes, pot of 20,000. Yes, we have a starter pot. Okay, yes. all right. Um, and then, so if the um, intergovernmental agreement is still going to be coming before the city council for uh, this request with the RPC, is it appropriate at this time to allocate 100000 or should we wait until we have that agreement? So you could choose to wait. I think our thinking was that would be coming soon and we're amending the budget now, so we would pick it up. I mean, the funds are restricted, so it really, there's only limited purposes for which they can be used in any case. So it's not as if it could be spent on anything else, but you, you could choose to, to wait until we approve the agreement. I, maybe the city administrator could talk about where we're at on that. I hope to bring the agreement to you at the next committee of the whole meeting in two weeks. Okay, so, so just for clarification purposes, even if we agree to move from the ARPA funds, 100,000, it still cannot be spent until the intergovernmental agreement is actually approved by city council. So it, it's, it, I just want to be clear about that. That's right. Correct, correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Chandra, you have a um, The 54,000 for the air packs, um, where, where is that coming from? Is it just reallocated within the fire budget or? So we've reallocated that within the VRF, the Vehicle and Equipment Replacement Fund. So at some point we will have to reevaluate and kind of look at our long-term funding there, but it, at this point we think that's manageable. Thank you. Therese? I guess my question, because I see this so seldom, um, how many street sweepers do we have? I, I might need help from Public Works. I'm going to say two. Okay. Because I, I, I see them very seldom. So my question is, um, we're going to be replacing one of them? C 
correct. And then the other one, when would that would be a for replacement? Um, it's, it's probably just on a different replacement cycle. I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up, Hopefully. but I can get that okay. for you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I have two, I believe. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain a little more about the cable TV, um, what video production switcher is, or if anyone could, or we can get more from the appropriate person possibly. I just didn't know what that was um, out of curiosity. And um, anyway, I guess maybe the more relevant financial question is so then those funds are transferred over. Are they still available, or do we need to do this video production switcher in fiscal year 2022? Right, so, so it's something that was originally in the fiscal year 21 budget. We thought it would be committed and we'd have a purchase order before June 30th, but we didn't. And so in order, in order for that purchase to be made, we now have to budget it in the current fiscal year. Oh, but then it will be purchased this year. Yeah, it would be purchased this year, yes. Thank you. And my second question was about the ARP um, administration group. And so you're saying that would be an intergovernmental agreement that we'll have a proposal of soon that would be a group with RPC for managing the distribution and reporting and all of that of the funds, correct? Yes, and in addition to that, they're, go they're going to basically be expanding our staff capacity to conduct the public engagement process around developing what we're calling a concept plan which is really what do you want to prioritize and then they will help us manage the proposal process as well um, when we receive proposals to impl it, uh, toward implementing whatever your priority the priorities that you set we don't have the staff bandwidth and they do and if, if we didn't contract with them using the um, intergovernmental agreement we'd have to go out and um, do an RFP for this kind of support, consulting support, which would add time and potentially cost. Thank you. And so would the $100,000 be going towards this, like to regional planning or towards the staff or it any of be, those above costs? It will be transferred. I, 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 there's a few details about uh, how exactly it's going to get, get um, transferred in the IGA. That's some of the things we have to work through. But um, it will be transferred to RPC, and then they will pay their, their staff who, who will be supporting us. Thank you. And maybe one more on that then. Um, <clears throat> would it be everything goes through RPC, or would, like, I guess, if, would the pots of money still be, like, separate for Champaign-Urbana, the county, or that would all be, like, one pot of money that RPC No, the is? pots will stay okay. separate. Um, they have a, a really important skill set that, that um, is going to be useful for us in that they have a lot of experience managing um, and accounting for federal funds. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of paperwork and reporting and accounting and um, there will be um, not only for the funds but also for our performance of, of what we spend the money on. And I think, I think they bring a skill set that it would cost us a lot to go out and hire in the private sector. So we're really lucky that they're available to do this. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then could we have a motion? I move, um, <laughs> move to uh, approve uh, for approval, uh, well, to move to city council, uh, the ordinance uh, ordinance number 2120 and ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance budget amendment number one omnibus thank you get it out <laughs> omnibus second <laughs> thank you did you want oh, that the on the consent, consent agenda for uh to, to the city council Okay, so we have a motion by Sharice for approval with recommendation to the consent agenda. And um, Chandra, does your second still stand with that? Yes, with the consent agenda, second. Okay, great. Thank you. Any discussion? Oh, I'm supposed to say that we shouldn't put that on the consent agenda because it's a budget amendment. Okay. Uh, I Sharice? Should okay, then let's take it off the budget agenda and put it on the regular agenda. <laughs> Sorry. And that works just as well for me. Uh, <laughs> Same. Three seconds. 
<laughs> okay, so, so now we have the motion for um, approval with recommendation with recommendation for approval, not on the consent agenda by Cherie, seconded by Chandra. Any other discussion? Okay, um, could we have a roll call, please? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkins? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Mayor Marlin? Yes. Thank you, and that motion carries. Thank you all for your input. Um, next, we have resolution number 2021-07-030R, resolution authorizing acceptance of AARP Community Challenge Grant Growing Community Program, and we have a presentation. Good evening, Council. This is my first time in front of a few of you. My name is Rachel Storm. I serve as the city's arts and culture coordinator. I'm really excited to bring this um, resolution authorizing acceptance of an AARP grant, not to be confused with ARP. Um, we were awarded a grant, the City of Urbana, by way of the Arts and Culture Program in the amount of $20,000 for something the AARP calls the Community Challenge Grant. The grant is supposed to support making communities more livable for people of all ages. The project that we put forward um, was something we called the Growing Community Initiative as a public art initiative that invites local artists to design and install artworks in selected community gardens, um, inclusive of installation works, murals, sculptures, benches, and other um, amenities and engagements in the gardens. Artwork it will be selected through a jury process. It will engage the mission of each community garden celebrating sustainability, diversity, the local food systems, native plants, and community building among neighbors. Selected artworks will not only engage in things like creative placemaking and beautification, but the goal is to also amplify support for the work of our smaller community gardens, many of whom have participated in projects like Solidarity Gardens Initiative and many of the other things that you've heard about throughout the pandemic to also support sustenance for our community. Um, they will be selected for their creativity and innovative ways they invite engagement in the dynamic local history of our community gardens, showcasing cultural diversity of Urbana, and creating additional garden infrastructure. So as I mentioned, benches, shade sails, things that will make the garden more livable and comfortable. Um, in these ways, we also hope to provide um, increased disability accessibility, language accessibility, and intergenerational engagement. They will be installed at six community gardens, including Cunningham Township Community Garden, Victory Park Community Garden, Habitat for Humanity Community Garden, the Learman Neighborhood Community Garden, Meadowbrook Community Gardens, and the Peace Garden, which is a project of the Central Illinois um, Mosque and Islamic Center and the First Mennonite Church of Urbana. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that story, it's a beautiful interfaith story between the two uh, faith traditions, and the, it's located on Springfield Avenue. Uh, the grant award is in the amount of twenty thousand um, dollars you have a copy of the grant agreement explaining terms um, and it will be of well excuse me it will be available before the august 9th meeting of the city council we actually just received it today from aarp so it was unable to be included in your packet um, staff is bringing the resolution to the committee of the whole prior due to the short-term project completion this is a pretty short-term project, um, and AARP is supposed to do these rapid, rapid projects that have an end date of mid-October. As indicated, funds received by this grant will be used specifically to support this program. There will be no fiscal impact on the city's general fund as the funding comes from the AARP. All increases in revenues and expenditures are included in the omnibus budget amendment brought forth just now by the Human Resources and Finance Department. Your options, of course, today are to forward the resolution to City Council with a recommendation for approval with suggested changes, forward the resolution with no recommendations due to not having the grant terms, or to not forward the resolution to accept the AARP grant. At present, we recommend forwarding the resolution to City Council with no recommendation until the grant agreement can be provided to Council on August 9th. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, let's go Chris first. So six gardens, correct. six projects, $20,000. Correct. Okay. We did originally ask for 30000 so we are looking for um, ways to ensure that we can still meet as, as many of the 
areas and neighborhoods that we were hoping to meet with the original proposal, but we are amending some of the things that it will include. And typically that's also meant that I've been visiting with individual gardens to talk about like what are the needs that you would want to prioritize. And then so certain gardens would prioritize something more like an engagement versus something like, an, or an installation versus a bench or something that's a bit more costly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary Alice. Um, so you mentioned that Learman was one of them. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not in the memo. I know, and I noticed that belatedly, and this came before my eyes, so you get my apologies there. No, but no, it no, is one no of apologies the needed, but it did kind of beg the question to me, would it be appropriate for us to put in the therefore part of the um, resolution, it's a resolution, right, our resolution, the location of where these are planned to be? So anybody looking up the resolution would be, oh, this goes in these gardens. And they would have to dig through the whole, everything else. I think that that isn't inappropriate, but I will tell you from the planner's perspective, this was a grant we heard um, from, we received information that we were awarded it recently. We are one of 244 projects out of 3,500 that were accepted across the United States. So only 244 were funded, um, but it is short term. So in that sense, our hope is to make sure that we're meeting all, all six gardens with some sort of engagement, but what will be there because it's still unclear who's, who's choosing which item, um, there's a little bit of um, information that I think is still needed to be able to accurately say what will be at each garden. I, I'm sorry, let me clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it, I'm just suggesting that we add in that the intent for the, for the installations would be at these locations, yeah. not what the installations will be at the okay. locations, if that makes sense. Then yes, I think that would be accurate and appropriate. Okay, mm -hmm. um, then uh, I'll make a, well, I'll let other people have questions. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, I did have one, but I just lost it. Okay, maybe just recapping. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that we'll have the grant agreement uh, by the next meeting. Yes, my and, understanding um, is we received it through email today. Okay. So it will be in your packet for the 9th. Okay, and mm -hmm. so that's like the whole AARP grant to you all, right? That's correct. And then what about um, your jury composition and mm -hmm. process? And do you have kind of an agreement with the artists? Or is that kind of further down the road? Or would that also be part of the grant agreement, kind of like the, the second end dispersal of funds? Yes, I appreciate that question. The, um, the grant agreement won't stipulate how we contract with artists, per se. So um, the arts and culture program typically has our own agreements that we'll have with artists, sort of dependent on what they're doing. So if they're being paid, for instance, an artist honorarium to host one of our open scene, open mic nights, um, that would have a different kind of agreement than, say, if they were um, being selected through a jury process to install a public artwork. Um, so we would handle our own contracts um, for that, and it would be um, not necessarily an, an arrangement with the AARP. The AARP would just be the grant arrangement. Um, you asked about juries. <laughs> I'm just mm -hmm. backtracking my mind. Yeah. Um, the way we jury um, is pretty much standard within our program of the arts and culture program. Um, what we try to do is, is select people that come from a wide range of artistic backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, social identity backgrounds, and make sure we get a, a good diversity of participation. I would say on average, our juries have between six and seven people on them, sometimes more, sometimes less, dependent on the project. Um, but the other part of our process that we would be employing here with the gardens, and we outline this in our, in our grant and when, in our communication with the gardens, is that we typically have a jury come up with a top three for that site, but then the garden itself would select the final mm. installation or final decision of what would be installed in their space. Um, so in that way, we really like to encourage um, not only that we have a, um, a jury that represents the public helping select, but then also that the, the site that it's going has a lot of say and, and input and voice in the process. Great, thank you. Mm. Great project, thanks for doing all that. Other questions? Okay, and we'll look for a motion. Mary Alice. Um, I would like to suggest that in section one uh, on the now therefore that right after uh, benches and community gardens, we just place in parentheses what those community gardens are. Um, and then I would like to move resolution number 2021-07030-R, resolution accepting, sorry, authorizing acceptance of the AARP Community Challenge Grant 
for the growing community program to the consent agenda with a recommendation for approval to city council okay and did you want to do they recommended with um no recommendation until we get the grant agreement oh that's a good idea <laughs> let's take it off the consent agenda but thank you're, you you're welcome to thank yes. you no 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 let's take it off the consent agenda and just put no recommendation to city council is this with the amendment you're talking this is with the change in the text on section one just to put in the name of the gardens oh okay yeah second okay thank you so we have a motion by mary alice with the additional language of add listing the garden locations as in the earlier part of the memo including learman that's not in the earlier part too right and um for with no recommendation and we'll look forward to the grant agreement at the next meeting seconded by Sharice any discussion could we have a uh, I guess we can do a voice call for this one right okay um, all in favor with ayes aye. aye any opposed okay that carries thank you thank you Rachel thank you <laughs> I think I'm sticking around for your next one. okay great <laughs> uh, well our next one is resolution number 2021-07-031 R resolution authorizing acceptance of an Illinois Arts Council agency grant for youth employment project from arts and culture program thank you our arts and culture program was recently awarded a summer youth employment in the arts grant from the Illinois Arts Council this is a grant that we do have a history of receiving um, year after year with the arts program. We've been very lucky with this grant. Um, and what it does is it supports summer interns currently enrolled or recently graduated from high school. Um, so not yet having entered college. Uh, the student intern's role is to provide general administrative support to the arts and culture program. The student employees are responsible for things like social media content development, events and program planning, um, engagement and marketing campaigns, updating and organizing email listservs, as well as providing general programmatic support um, we received fifty one hundred dollars this year um, the internship gives each student employee insight on running a local arts agency housed within city government it's a pretty unique vantage point as most of the local arts agencies that participate are not connected to local government so they get that public um, local government experience as well um, we have an emphasis on outreach and public engagement. Of course, during the pandemic, that's also meant hybrid programs, virtual engagement. Um, they expect to learn the basics of arts programming, but also marketing, communication, organizational skills, um, outreach, and community work. They also gain knowledge on board management and public process by participating in our arts and culture commission meetings. And student employees have the opportunity to take initiative, solve problems, work collaboratively, take more initiative, take even more initiative, as they were working a lot remotely and had to take on a lot of independent work. Um, they received the same grant, uh, as I said, we have received the same grant in the previous fiscal year, um, and we've been able to hire local high schoolers um, each time. The grant has already been awarded to the city. It's a summer youth employee grant, so we've already had some students working for us through this grant. But it is necessary to adopt a resolution signifying a formal acceptance by city council, outlining the terms uh, under which the grant funds have been provided. Again, this is in the amount of $5,100. You do have a copy of the grant agreement. Um, attached here and there will be used specifically to support three high school student interns over the summer of 2021 and completely cover the interns wages and FICA the grant agreement requires expenditure of funds between May 15th and September 15th matching fund requirements are entirely covered by our existing programs um, all increases in revenues and expenditures related to the grant are included again in the omnibus budget amendment brought forth by HR and finance your options today are to approve the resolution to accept the grant, approve the resolution with changes, or to not approve the resolution. And of course, staff recommends the city council approve the resolution authorizing acceptance of the Illinois Arts Council Summer Youth Employee, Employee Grant to the Arts and Culture Program for the city of Urbana. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, do we have a motion? I'd like to move to for acceptance um, of the resolution number 2021-07031R, resolution authorizing acceptance of an Illinois Arts Council agency grant for a youth employment project and um, move that for approval. Did you want that on the consent agenda? 
Uh, agenda? No. Okay, so motion for. Huh? The motion oh, to be put on the consent agenda? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll second. <laughs> okay. All right, we have a motion by Sharice for um, moving that to council with recommendation for approval and on the consent agenda, seconded by Mary Alice. Any discussion? Okay, and uh, we do voice vote for this one. All in favor with aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have ordinance number 2021-07-031, an ordinance amending schedule H of section 23-93 of the Urbana local traffic code requiring stop signs at a certain at certain intersection, Lexington Drive at Myra Ridge, Vernon Drive at Myra Ridge Drive, Horizon uh, Lane at Myra Ridge Drive, Memory Lane at Myra Ridge Drive, Hillshire Drive at Myra Ridge Drive. And I believe we have presentations. Um, hi, I'm Shannon Baranek. Uh, most of you probably haven't seen me. Uh, I believe there's an, a city council changeover since last of one of these. I represent the traffic commission for the city of Urbana. I'm the civil engineer. We also have Rich Searles as our police representative. And currently we have a city council vacancy. So if anybody would like to join us, feel free to put your name in the hat. Um, this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, in the Southridge subdivision, there was a lot of streets that did not have um, any kind of stop or yield control. And typically as things are built, you rely on people to follow the rules of the road and yield when like, oh, there's someone coming. However, when that fails, um, we tend to put in stop signs. So in the memo I provided with you, that's pretty much what letter A describes is the normal right of way uh, rule is not being followed on Myra Ridge. Uh, we had complaints from residents. I evaluated the, the areas and Came up with the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, came up with the uh, five stop signs you see on the exhibit. So uh, this was voted unanimously between me and Ritz Searles for traffic commission for approval and bringing forth the city council. So. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Mary Alice. So you had mentioned that residents were the people who approached the city or the traffic commission about this? Yes, they, um, they filled out the ticker form through Barb Steele and she presented it um, to me for uh, evaluation. So just curious how many residents filled it out? I believe two. Two so, residents? Yes. Uh, and if I remember from watching the traffic commission, there haven't been any accidents? <laughs> no, it's just, um, uh, so Urbana does things a little differently than Champaign. When Champaign has a whole new subdivision, they actually make the developer put in stop signs, street signs, all of that. Urbana does it after the fact and evaluates the streets as they are and not how the developer really wanted them. So in this case, we determined that Myra Ridge is the major street. Um, mm -hmm. The developer may, if they were left up to it, may have decided the cross streets are the major street. So it just, um, the way our process is, we tend to go back after the fact and put in the stop control. So it's usually reliant on, um, because there are so many streets out there, it is reliant on uh, resident bringing it to our attention. So. Like there was one uh, when Craig Shankwire was still here, uh, Stillwater Landing, it was a T intersection with no stop control and people were not yielding. There actually was an accident at that one, so. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, other questions? Yes, James. So if I remember correctly, uh, when we approved the additional um, platting of this, of this area, Horizon Lane is gonna go all the way through to Philo Road and could eventually become considered a main access street. Uh, that'd be Hillshire actually, and right now is it's it currently Hill not scheduled to go through to Philo. Is it, oh, it's Hillshire? Okay, Yeah. great, thank you. Thank you, other questions? Um, I have one, I was wondering if these uh, stop signs you were, cause it's just the roads leading into Myra Ridge, not on along Myra Ridge, yeah, correct? None are, none are on Myra Ridge itself. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if it was gonna be um, marked with that, you know, like two-way stop only or cross traffic does not stop there, if that it was gonna be clearly marked with the signs? Typically when we have a um, cross street that does not stop, we do add the black and gold, cross traffic does not stop. Thank you, yes, I do think that would be really helpful since some of them are four-way stops, a few, you know, I think it would be and, helpful yeah, to have that. And four-ways always get the little four-way designation or three-way if it's a T. Great, thank you. That was all. Any other questions? 
Okay. Uh, yes, Sharice. I guess my question is, as I, as I watch, as I look at this, because, <laughs> because there, there's, um, and Myra Ridge Road isn't drive or whatever, it's not that, that um, it doesn't seem to be that long. What, what, what does it, how far does it run? All the way up to, uh, I believe, Windsor. Florida, Windsor. Windsor. Yeah, it's a, it's a long road and also a bus route to the north of which you can see on the exhibit. So it's from uh, Windsor, to, where does it begin? I'm trying to see that. That's what I'm trying. It begins at Hillshire Drive? Yeah, and heads all the way up north to Windsor. It heads north to Windsor. Yes, and, and I believe along that length there is one four-way stop. I believe it Mark Trail maybe, or maybe it's a two-way. On And Myra actually has a stop on that one. Okay, so my, I guess my question, because I have... You know, I'm, I'm not familiar. Is there any chance that anyone will want to cross Myra Ridge Drive from any of these streets, like m cross the street? Because of what I guess what I'm what I'm wondering is if there. It's kind of like what the what Grace was saying that there are stop signs at all of the other streets, and Myra Ridge has nothing. Right. So my question is. I, I guess I see sidewalks. At the sidewalks, is there going to be any kind of signage so that these people, so that people can cross the street to get to the other side, to go, maybe go to Memory Lane? The or, sidewalks are laid out to be pedestrian crosswalks. They're ADA accessible already. They have detectable warnings, and it is an unmarked crosswalk existing. Like, we don't have to put any of those in. So. so okay, okay, so it's a... It's a it's a crosswalk, but it's unmarked crosswalk. Yes. Okay. All right, and it, it just appears dangerous to me. I guess that's what I'm thinking. It's to not, not a, have any kind of. It's not a high volume road, and um, when you have an unmarked crosswalk, it actually increases pedestrian awareness because there isn't the signage that kind of gives a mental shield, so to speak. So when it's unmarked, it actually does make people look better when they're the pedestrian. Um, okay. Like, so it's like you can cross any, you can legally cross at any crosswalk. Like it doesn't have to have stripes. Right. So I just wanted to know because I and I'm not because like I said I'm not familiar, but uh, I, so therefore I really don't know the traffic pattern and and all that of Myra Ridge. This in, section in is itself. only the few residential houses you see on the map. It's still being developed, so there is not a whole lot of traffic or pedestrian traffic. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? <clears throat> Could we have a motion? I'm sorry for the giant title you're going to have to read. <laughs> <laughs> I move to, um, I move ordinance number 2021-07-031, an ordinance amending schedule H of section 23-93 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code requiring stop signs at a certain inter intersection. Lexington Drive at Meyer Ridge Drive, Vernon Drive at Meyer Ridge Drive, Horizon Lane at Meyer Ridge Drive, Memory Lane at Meyer Ridge Drive, Hillshire Drive at Meyer Ridge Drive, to City Council for approval on the consent agenda. A second. Oh, who do I go with when there's a tie? Do you rock, <laughs> paper, scissors it? Or <laughs> what? Who is it? You said he have it? Okay. You're so nice, Sharice. Okay, so we'll give it to James. So we'll say motion by Chandra for um, recommendation for approval on consent agenda, seconded by James. Any discussion? Yes, Mayor Marlin. Just wanted to let you know, um, Chandra has volunteered to serve as the council representative to the Traffic Commission, and I'll be bringing that appointment to council next week. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> we don't meet very often, so it's not a huge time commitment. So, but I, I do appreciate having the council member again. So, awesome. Any further discussion? Um, I had one just to address this area because it is my ward and neighborhood, and I walk my dog through there frequently along this mapped route um, and the whole area. And I do think that these stop signs are a good idea. Um, I 
especially with all that new development that there's going to be a lot more traffic and it is kind of confusing because I believe it is trails drive is maybe the only stop along Myra Ridge um, so it is kind of confusing and all of these other streets that feed into it without having stop signs um, I could see that leading to some issues once all these houses are filled so I do think that that's a good idea and that they're well placed and will definitely help for safety um, but I think especially having it clear that cross traffic doesn't stop will be really important as well Okay, could we have a roll call, please? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries. Thank you very much. Amen. And next we have ordinance number 2021-07-032, an ordinance vacating a walkway in Countryshire Estates. And we have presentation, looks like, from Tim. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Is this good? I don't know how close I can't hear it. Oh, can't hear you. Can't turn it on. Let's try that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay, um, just brief overview of this one. This was a uh, normally platted uh, walkway in a, an older subdivision here in town. Um, we were approached by one of the adjacent property owners with a request to vacate this walkway. They are pursuing to reconstruct a fence in, on their property. And as part of that process, you know, they have figured out, you know, this may be uh, an issue for them. Um, in doing so, we talked and uh, we met with and sent out petitions to other adjacent property owners that are touching this uh, existing walkway right of way. Uh, we've received petitions back from all adjacent owners uh, recommending the vacation of this, essentially a 50-50 split. 50% uh, will go to each adjacent property owner. Um, there was no opposition to any of that from any of the adjacent property owners. There was no opposition from our department, any other departments, um, or any other city staff uh, for the vacation of this. Um, there's no uh, financial impact to this. Uh, the policy states that benefiting residential properties don't have to pay the land value of the vacated right-of-way. And because it's not a street right-of-way, there's no need for a public hearing. Um, our recommendation is to approve the ordinance vacating a public walkway between East Rainbow View and East Country Squire Drive due south of Rainbow Court. And I'll accept any questions. Yes, James, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess <clears throat> in some cases when these are platted this way, they actually put the sidewalk in, but this one they didn't put the sidewalk in. Yeah, and, 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 sorry. Yes, and, and the, the history behind it, I don't know exactly, but sometimes it's, when they have a development and there's a potential additional development, interconnectivity is unknown at that time. So okay. they, they plat them or the request was made at some point for that, that never came to fruition. And, and it looks like one of the property owners already has um, kind of moved into the uh, walkway <laughs> with a building. And that is a very common theme in town. Yes. Okay. So um, I, I'm just curious, I know in my neighborhood, a lot of those sidewalks got put in and people use those. So you're saying that because there's no concrete here, there's not people walking through it because it's not really a sidewalk. You don't have to ask the surrounding neighborhood to see if they're okay with giving up what would have been Cor value if, if it had been done when it was put in. Correct, and it's not that it couldn't be done. It's never been used as such. We, we have the right <clears throat> as of now to put a sidewalk in there if, there's, if there were a need, but based on the interconnectivity and other sidewalks in the area, we don't feel there's a need from our perspective or any other department perspectives. All right, thank, thank you for satisfying my curiosity. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, I had one, you were talking about the sidewalk interconnectivity, but I don't see any sidewalks on this map at least. Yeah, and that's the other part of it. In this situation, there's nothing to connect to. In some situations, there would be sidewalks there that would be connecting to, but we have nothing to even connect to at this point, so we have even less purpose for this. Thank you. And another one, has the city been, like, maintaining this walkway or anything? At no. All? Okay. And so this would just be relinquishing it, split between those four property owners, everything adjacent, and we haven't been 
maintaining or Cor doing anything correct with it. there's the other part of this process is checking with other utility easements and things of that nature and nobody else is occupying the space or using it at this point in time the adjacent property owners are maintaining this space and we ha we don't feel there's a need for us to take it over and quite frankly you know any property that we own it's our responsibility eventually so if they wanted to quit taking quit taking care of this because they needed to move their fence three or four feet you know they would have an argument to say you know city may put this on your mowing list and it would just be another unnecessary property for us to maintain thank you yes Mary Alice so how does this work in terms of updating their plats uh, essentially uh, our professional land server will go through and it just the vacate the the plats themselves I don't know that there's a formal there's not a formal process to update their plats I think it's more of just an act of vacation and then that gets recorded and then that's tied to the properties the, the future records they would see that this this easement that was originally platted is now vacated it's it's more of a paperwork well uh, what I what I don't want to happen is I, I don't want to have uh, there is a there is a I don't know if it was a group or just one individual who's going around buying up these very little pieces these little property and like trying to sell them to the people when they thought they already owned it sure so I, I'm just I just want to make sure that the property owners if we agree to vacate this that it's updated in their records so that they don't like lose like two feet of their yard if I'm making any sense right no it there will be a document recorded vacating the this which will be tied to their property so that the be plat tied itself would never retroactively be right but that would be at the county yes okay because actually we vacated part of an alley and I never actually got anything saying that that's part of my property now so right and, uh, and it's it should have been recorded at the county so you should be able to find public record of the vacation okay All right. i can get you more details on that from dan rothermel who knows more about it i just want to protect the property owners i don't want them to build Absolutely. something and then have somebody come back and say no that's mine because i bought it at a real estate right. tax sale yep thank you any other questions okay do we have a motion I move to uh, for appro approval to City Council for ordinance number 2021-07032 at uh, an ordinance vacating a walkway in Country Square Estates uh, for approval to the City Council on the consent agenda. A consent agenda. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. We've got the motion to move this to council with recommendation for approval on the consent ag agenda by Cherise, seconded by Mary Alice. Any discussion? Could we have a roll call, please? Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Okay, and that motion carries. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And next we have ordinance number 2021-07-033, an ordinance approving a First Amendment right-of-way license agreement between New Cellular Wireless, PCS, LLC, DBA, AT&T, oh my goodness, Mobility, <laughs> and the City of Urbana, Illinois. And we have a presentation on this one after all the acronyms. This also, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a brief one. So we entered into a license agreement with uh, New Singular, essentially AT&T, to install and occupy right-of-way for small cellular facilities. Um, the gist of that is, generally speaking, they want to occupy our light poles to put these small cell facilities intact um, throughout the city. We entered into that in agreement um, in 2019. Uh, the amendment to this is really just more logistical, but I wanted to get something on paper so that we could take care of it if need be. The original agreement was they were going to attach uh, equipment to our light poles, and now what they've found is there's more value for them to replace our existing light poles so that they know it's the, the structural integrity is good, but in doing so, they would like to 
if we have a light mounted at 30 feet and they need their cell thing to be at 35 feet, they want to build a 35 foot pole all, all inclusive together without having a, a breakaway or anything like that, which we're fine with. Uh, the, the amendment really just puts them on the hook that if they put, want to put like a 10 foot, uh, a, you know, 40 foot pole for a 30 foot mount light, we would have the ability to tell them you have to come and perform modifications to cut the 10 foot off and cap it just to remove any excess liability on us. Um, and that's pretty much all the amendment covers. There's no financial changes, uh, anything like that. It's really a logistical thing. Um, their construction is actually, generally speaking, they're installing a new light pole almost at every location that I've seen. So we are gaining some infrastructure or updating some infrastructure there, I guess I would say. Thank and you. our recommendation would be to approve the ordinance or the amendment. Thank you. Questions? I guess I'll Mary Alice first. Um, so this talks about Exhibit A, which is the location, and I didn't find that in here. So if that could be provided to us prior to City Council, that would be appreciated. Which actually my, my main question is, I know that there are some areas in this city that have uh, different kinds of light poles. I'm thinking uh, Wuna, for example, has mm -hmm. is different style light poles. It's not actually a light pole. It's almost like a... Right. Yeah, right. So are these, are, are they proposing to put any of these in some of the different kinds of light pole areas? I'm not talking Wuna. There's other areas that right. have different structures, right? Not as of now. I think they've got five as part of their original proposal. And for additional ones, they'll have to resubmit those for review and approval by our department. Um, to say yay or nay, you know, uh, uh, what, the, what depending on the application, because every every single one of these is a little, it's kind of a minor construction project either way. So I think there were five or six as part of the, what exhibit A that's not included here that I'll get for you. Um, and outside of that, we don't have additional plans from them for where they would propose putting up additional ones. So in, in terms of the requirement, if they're going to, if they want to replace the pole, do they have to replace it in like design? Yes. Perhaps that's the best way to say. It. Yes. And what we're running into with some of those is we have 25 year old poles and the infrastructure we have is obsolete. So they have to ask us for what is our recommended alternative. So we're getting, you know, today's grade technology um, in replace for 25 years and aging stuff that we struggle to replace anyways. Okay, and, and I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but how much, I know they, they pay us money to do this. They basically lease space on our light poles. I don't know, that fee was in the, it should have been in the original license agreement. Yeah, for I don't that. remember and what I'm it not, is, because I've seen that. I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay, I'm just, it, so this doesn't impact how much they were planning on paying us, even no. though they have to replace the whole pole. Correct. Thank you, James. Yeah, kind of along the same lines. I assume that if, if we have standards for light pollution, they have to replace it with the pole that meets meets that standard. Right. We we start public works to us to approve everything that they propose. Okay. Essentially, they have more. They would love for us just to tell them exactly what it is. But I've also kind of felt like you guys need to do a little bit of legwork to figure that out. And if the, something's obsolete, then we'll do some more legwork to tell you exactly what we need it replaced with. And I'm kind of guessing that this is part of their 5G deployment to reach more of the community. It'd yeah. be very interesting to have a map of where they do this yeah. and see if they're serving all of our neighborhoods or only some. Yeah, and I, Exhibit A, like I said, um, I can get a copy of that. I think uh, the, I, or the original copy I found that we had scanned wasn't the recorded copy. And one of them had the map included, and one of them had as a second, a separate scan. So that's probably what this one is. But it's probably also the signed and recorded copy. Um, but I'll, I'll get that to you, and that'll at least show you where they're proposing as of now. Um, we can certainly request. You know, if, I think the idea was they did like a package of these where this was mm -hmm. gonna increase their service to a specific location, and if they do it again, it's probably gonna be another grouping of a number of these two further do that it's it, it's unlikely that we're going to see one pole at a time and that will be you know future locations future future applications will still allude to future fees and future uh, plan reviews yeah because this has a great opportunity to expand accessibility yeah 
to broadband if if they have if all of our community has access to it. Definitely. Thank you. Other questions? I have a few. Uh, quick. Uh, could, do you know like roughly how many uh, locations we're talking about? I like, believe there was five or six in the original application. Okay. Thank you. And with the new light poles, will it change the height of the light? Like you were saying, 30-foot light and their 5-foot thing, the light will still be at 30. The light will be mounted at the prescribed the because it, it all has to do with the photometrics of the road and the other lights in the area. If you have 200-foot spacing and 30-foot poles and the photometrics of it, you, you, it's all designed for a certain a level of service, we'll say. So the lights will remain mounted at their proposed height, their original height, I'll say. Thank you. And is there anything for... Um, like an end date, like if AT&T no longer does service, are they like taking down their poles or are they I, keeping them? In the original in the license agreement, I believe it was 20 years and there's termination requirements and options in there for both us and them, uh, both of which require them to remove their equipment. This was really the modification for if you're putting a new pole in and you want a 10 foot extension on there and we feel like it's an area that we don't want that 10 foot of liability we can tell you to come cut it, cap it to our standards and get it off our liability. Mm -hmm. Is there something in there of like the ending transition or one of those options is that like the new poles stay as part of all, like passed all, on to city ownership? Or? It, it, the poles will be ours. Okay. They're, they're essentially replacing our infrastructure so that it better supports theirs. And okay. the infrastructure for us will always stay. They will just, you, we could tell them to remove it if there was, a, if, if we ever had that, that need we could you know essentially the idea is when you're done or if you're done your equipment has to go in accordance i think how it reads is per the requirements of the city engineer so it gives us flexibility to say take just your equipment and cap this pole or just take your equipment the five foot extension is not doing us any harm right now um, or remove the whole pole because this is not in a location that we need a pole anymore we've done another project and it's obsolete so Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, looking for a motion and considering that we're um, going to add Exhibit A that's not in here now, too. And uh, we're going to do a motion. Sure. I'll move ordinance number 2021-07033, an ordinance approving a first amendment to right away license agreement between new singular wireless PCS LLC doing business as AT&T Mobility in the city of Urbana uh, to city council. Um, I'm going to say without recommendation since we don't have the exhibit. Yeah, I thought, I'd like to see the locations. So I'd like to know where the locations are. Is that a second then? Yeah, a second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, but that's okay. I want to know where the locations are. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. So we have a motion by James. Um, to move this ordinance to council without a recommendation so we can look take a look at exhibit a and the seconded by sharice any <coughs> discussion okay, could we have a roll call please miss Wu. yes miss harsey yes miss bishop yes miss wilkin yes mr quisenberry yes mr evans yes Thank you, that motion carries. And our last item on agenda, thank you Tim, is council input and communications. Are there any council members? Yes, James. Yeah, I just think it uh, bears um, mentioning that uh, the University of Illinois and OSF Healthcare have um, uh, come together to provide uh, testing, COVID testing at no charge, and they have locations currently at the State Farm Center on campus and at Parkland College. The campus location is going to move to uh, Campus Recreation Center East uh, a little bit later in the month. But they have hours every day of the week. You have to look. You can Google Shield CU OSF and there's a website that has details of the hours that they're open and which days it is at which location. They're not open at the same time. It alternates. Uh, but anybody who needs COVID testing can go to these sites and w at no charge uh, take the benefit of the University of Illinois developed saliva test and get results um, essentially the same day if they need to be tested. There's an app 
called Safer Community that you can use to do that, but it's not required. If you don't want to put this on an app, you can just go and walk up and, and do it without a smartphone or a smart device. So everybody should be tested if they feel like they need to be. Thank you. Any other council members wish to make comments? Yes, Mayor Marlin. A couple of things. One, I want to remind folks that every Friday, the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District hosts a free vaccination clinic at their facility at 201 West Kenyon Road. And I know there are other um, clinics offered throughout the community, but this is the one that, that takes place every Friday. As of today, uh, we sadly lost another individual to COVID, so we now have a total of 160 people who have died from COVID in Champaign County. Testing at the mall, uh, Marketplace Mall is still available, and today there were 254 tests performed, which is way up from what's been the case in the last few weeks. So I think the word about the Delta variant is getting out. But, but uh, testing is critically important, but most importantly is getting the vaccination. I also wanted to address the um, criticism that we heard regarding two meetings that were not held in July. First of all, there was one canceled meeting. That was the Committee of the Whole on July 19th. That was canceled because we were informed that both a number of city council members would be traveling on vacation out of town, not able to attend. And just as importantly, a fair number of city staff were finally able to take a vacation after 18 months of incredibly hard work um, doing their jobs plus um, addressing the COVID emergency in the community. And for their mental and physical health and well-being, it was critically important for people to be able to have a week or two off and so I'm really glad they did. The second meeting was not canceled. It was a council meeting scheduled for July 26th. That originally was rescheduled to tonight to handle a couple of, I think it was cases coming from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Those um, ultimately were pulled because they weren't going to be ready for tonight but it was not canceled originally. It was to be rescheduled. Um, I also want to point out to folks that just because a meeting isn't held doesn't mean work isn't going on in the city. We took this opportunity to do council briefings on a couple of topics that were really needed um, extra information being provided. We are laying the groundwork for a number of initiatives that will be introduced in the next few weeks, including the rollout of the discussions on the American Rescue Plan funding. Um, use of force policy, we, we're, we're done as far as I'm concerned. That will be presented to the public. Uh, we also briefed council on some other things in the works. The Human Re uh, Historic um, Preservation Commission is going to be considering the certificate of appropriateness for the Hotel Royer this coming Wednesday. That took an enormous amount of staff preparation as well. So. Um, the, the fact that people are um, not meeting once in a while doesn't mean that the work isn't getting done in the city and you will start to see things roll out. So thank you. Thank you. Any other council members wish to comment? Yes, Sharice. Yeah, I just want to say something about us being put on a timer for our input and our communication when we talk at our meeting. I'm serious, this is crap. So it needs to stop. Don't put me on a timer when I'm talking about some stuff that I get to talk about because it's my meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other council members wish to uh, give input? Okay, seeing no uh, further business. I do, I do need to add oh, one more sorry. piece yes. of information. Go ahead. Um, number one, that was put into council rules. And number two, uh, I do want to explain the language that we use when we cancel a meeting, uh, which refers to no agenda items, actually is specified in our council rules as the language that we're supposed to use. So we are following our council rules. Okay, any other uh, last call for comments? Okay, seeing no further business, this meeting is adjourned.